Hey there, this is Christoph with Click, and as promised in the second part of the video, I'm going to show you how you can set up email alerts with ClickSense. So I was trying not to make it too complicated, but also not too trivial, but uh, sorry guys, this is going to be a scripting exercise. It is not self-service. And it's also not a generic way, so if you want to have a new KPI alert uh, by the end of this video, this means you need to write more script. Um, let's go to the data manager and first let's add some data to our app. Um, for that purpose, I'm using my good old friend, the Nordwind database, um, which ships with Microsoft Access. And let's lay, load a couple of tables here. Like customers, employees, products, etc., etc. And I will use the default associations. I trust that this is good for now. Um, and I will also add an Excel sheet where I have some um, targets settings for each of the employees per month. So a certain sales target, and this is going to be the basis for my email alerts. So from C, there is an Excel file, the send mail sales targets. And for each employee ID, I'm providing here an email and a monthly sales target. So let's add this as well. and it connects to the order head next to the employees. So that is part one. Let's have a look on how the data model looks. Um, first of all, it's important for you to understand the differences between um, the the scripting data model and the associative data model once the data is loaded. What I'm trying to, to get out of fields month are employee email and the monthly target from the Excel sheet that I imported, maybe the first name for, for the email, and I wanted to calculate the uh, unit price times quantity, which is the sales volume. So how would I do that in the front end? Fairly easy exercise. I would simply create an object where I can add all those fields. The first name, I want the order date year month, the employee email, the monthly target. I would calculate as a measure, the unit price times quantity. Let's say I want to have uh, one specific month here, which is uh, January 2016. So I should see each uh, employee only once, his monthly target and his sales revenue. And now the email would go out for, for everybody who has not met his target. Yeah, now coming back to the differences. Here I am using fields from different tables. And in fact, the beauty of the associative engine is that I don't have to think about the fact that it comes from different tables. You can simply disregard it. In scripting, it's completely different. The associative engine doesn't exist at this point of moment. So it exists only after finishing the reload. What this means is, um, it's almost SQL, you have no hypercubes. So the dimensional tables on the fly, you need to do yourself. Instead of the hypercubes, you must create a table with group by and create the dimensionality manually. The only way that you can use aggregation formulas, like some sales or so. You have no association, the automatic links between the tables. That means you needed to do all the relevant joins manually using the join command. 
and you have no set modifier, that syntax is not available. So if you have something like this in the front end, you need to use a where condition to filter out the uh, rows that are not relevant. So um, the exercise is the following. All the fields are first going to be loaded into an unaggregated table. And that table is um, on the lowest granularity. So let's start with the pro order details and load those two fields we needed from there. Next, because we are going to load the order date, I need to add the ID field between these tables. So those fields that are um, representing the link. I needed the order ID from both. So I'm joining the order date into the order details temp table. Next, because I want to go to the employee table and to this Excel sheet, I needed the employee ID from the order table. Then I would need the first name from the employees table and last but not least, the employee email and monthly target from the Excel sheet that I imported. Here we are starting um, the fun part. The first temporary table, the, the unaggregated one, is loaded from the order details, resident order details, and it's calculating unit price times quantity as sales, and it adds the order ID. Why? Because in the next command, we will join on the order ID and add two more fields, order month and employee ID. The order month is another small difference. I don't have something like order month available on a field level that only exists later in the front end. So I have to manually set a uh, formula month start order date so that all of the days are, so to say, eliminated and uh, reduced to the first or the beginning of the month. And I'm using a formula here to format this nicely. So I'm getting uh, year and month. Then I'm joining another table that is the employee part. You remember the employee ID um, is the join field and I'm adding the first name from the employees table. And the last join is again on the employee ID, but this time from the Excel sheet. And I'm adding the monthly target and the employee email. Once this is done, now we will compress the date and calculate the, the monthly sales and determine if it was met or not. So the sum by, so the sum formula will be order details, uh, units price times quantity, and the group by will be order date, first name or the employee ID, and the email of the person together with the monthly target. The second table is the aggregated table. I will drop both temporary tables uh, later. The second table has the condition. This is the equivalent to the selection that we made. I am only interested in the February of 2016 in this case. Um, so that is the where condition. Then I'm loading a dimensionality of order month, employee ID, first name and email, and the monthly target. And here is the sum sales. By the way, because I'm going to compare the sales later in a formula, I have to use the US format. Even if you are uh, in your local currency, uh, local setting using um, comma as a decimal point here, it needs to be dot. So I'm using num to make sure it's in the right format. So that creates the aggregated table. And the last part now is the sending and the checking and sending of emails. So I'm iterating from the first to the last row of temp2. And there is a little shortcut here, a, a subroutine called set cursor, which gets me all the fields from the table into variables. So for those who are good in scripting, it reduces the need to make six or seven uh, peak calls. Instead of using peak seven times, I'm getting all the fields as variables, so I can instantly work with it. So uh, in, the in the syntax dollar brackets sales, that returns from the row number n, the sales, and it returns the monthly target from here, and it returns 
the first name, etc., etc. So next I'm computing a message and um, the email connector allows um, HTML. So I can use line breaks using uh, the BR tag, for example, and I can use uh, bold to make um, this in bold letters. So that is the message. Send the message was created from the application document name and that creates a double quote, by the way. And then the critical command here, send mail. And this is a flag here that says uh, force or not force sending emails. What do I mean by this? I wanted to avoid the resending of the same email with the next reload because I think, I think that is very annoying if you get this multiple times throughout uh, the same month. Um, so I'm loading, if already there, a log of already sent emails. When the sent email is uh, subroutine is, is called, I'm checking for this flag that I just showed you. If the email sending is forced, if it's yes, I'm sending the email with no further checks. If it's no, I'm checking the log here. It's a file uh, which I keep on the hard drive. Um, if it was sent before, if it was sent before, I'm ending the sub and it's not going to be sent out again. In fact, there's a little message printed. If not, then we are on the track and sending the email for the first time. If the email sending was successful, then I'm adding to the email log that this very message was sent. And if not, I'm printing an error that it could not be sent. Eventually, when all the uh, the loop is done, I'm going to save the log. So with that in mind, I think you will perfectly understand now this uh, subroutine here, uh, which is sending email. Yeah, um, as said, here is the flag force, which is zero or one. Here is a file, um, which I you can point to wherever you like uh, using this uh, library connection and the file name is going to be called uh, send email dot QVD. Um, I used to have it here in the temp drive. If I remove this file and run the whole script, as you can imagine, emails are going out and we can see um, and compare to what we initially selected if we've done everything right. There are a couple of emails going out now. Um, email was sent. Now I do have that file again created. That means if I rerun the same script again, it will tell me that the email has been sent before and it's not sending it again. So works as designed. And um, yeah, here are the different checks. Uh, for a technically interested, uh, I'm not saving the email recipient and message in plain text. I'm creating a hash of all the combination of recipient, copy, subject, and message. And that hash only is being saved. So I have no clue who received the email. I'm only able to determine if exactly that combination is used again. And if that's the case, by this if condition, it's going to bypass the sending and printing that message instead. Yeah, and uh, here is the part you already know. Um, sending out the email, uh, if you recall, this re uh, returns a table with a status field. And here I'm checking using peak command if that status was OK. Because if not, I'm of course not logging the email as sent. Um, I'm just printing an error message. Uh, so it would keep on trying sending out this email um, uh, the next time it's running. And if it was positive, yes, then, of course, the uh, send mail log is concatenated with a new row, um, date, time, and the email hash, and that's it. As I said initially, it's not trivial, and the reason being that you do not have access to the same business logic from script. So everything that you have in the front end um, with, on object level 
that hypercubes do not exist in script. There is a partner solution which is uh, which is uh, way easier to use. It is called click to go connector hypercube QVX, and that part actually simplifies a lot the first challenge, which is the scripting challenge uh, of not having access to the hypercube. So if you follow this small video, this connects to the app like you could do in the front end. So it's opening uh, executive dashboard here. You can see multiple objects in this uh, in this table and the objects are results from a hypercube so you don't need to worry how the formula behind uh, current year sales and last year sales is it turns this into a very intuitive uh, uh, sql statement so it retrieves the hypercube at once and you are you can get rid of all this um, uh, join and aggregated table exercise before. However, the sending of the email still is something um, you will need here. So with that, uh, let's conclude this video and see you next time. <music>